to record. One thing I say at the beginning of all of these webinars, you guys, watch this again, especially if you're new to the way I teach. I mean, the, I'm not going to say you're not going to find this long put diagonal online where you can go out there. Anybody can figure out how to do a long put diagonal, right? Not necessarily. I come up with specific rules. They're just going to tell you how to set up a diagonal, but I have specific rules, strike placement, environment, uh, the underlying, all of those things have to come together uh, in order for us to implement this strategy. All right, so make sure you pay attention to those. I don't mind if you take notes, but I would suggest taking the notes in the second round. First time through, you're gonna, your mind could be spinning and thinking of questions and things of that nature and may, maybe miss some of the nuances. The second time through, you're gonna, you're gonna be on top of it and, and actually remember it much longer. Uh, Tapas, I just started with my spiel. Everybody can hear me okay, right? Just do a quick mic check here, yeah? Sit me up in the questions box there. All right, creating the long put diagonal. This is gonna go into all of those rules. Yes, you can go out there and buy a, a, a long duration option and then sell a near duration option. That's your long put diagonal. Not necessarily. I'm gonna show you how you can create this strategy what the environment should be in order to increase your probabilities. But let me get a couple of things out of the way real quick. My name's Eric Wilkinson. Some of you guys may recognize me as the Wolfman from CNBC, Fox Business, or even the Wall Street Journal for my economic and geopolitical and market analysis. I've been trading my own money since college. So that's about over 25 years now. Uh, and I'm not here to tell you I'm gonna make you rich or make you a millionaire, but I am here to help you take control of your finances in order to increase your probabilities of success. Uh, I, like I mentioned, went to college, started with a psychology degree, started trading there, and then I decided, you know what, this is really what I wanna do, and switched it over to finance. After graduating college with that degree, I moved up to Chicago, uh, sold all my stocks, and jumped into the pits and started trading there. So in that time, I've traded everything from stocks, financial futures, commodity futures, uh, currencies and options basically on all those products and just about every market condition. Here's that same old disclaimer you guys have probably seen time and time again. Any opinions, news, research, and analysis or other information contained here or uh, information provided by associated companies or employees is for general commentary and does not constitute investment advice or solicitation to buy or sell any of the securities or strategies. At the end of the day, we're here to teach you guys how to swim. We're not here to swim for you. In that, I mean, I'm here to teach you some strategies that you can then go out and implement it into your portfolio in your own way. So do your own homework and please remember that past performance of any trading system or methodology is not necessarily indicative of future results. All right, final thing is Wolfman's blog is my Twitter handle and our parent company, Pro Trader Strategies, is at Pro Trader Strat. So you can follow us both on those. Um, I will usually tweet out snark <laughs> and or trades that I put on in the afternoon. For instance, I just tweeted out not too long ago that I sold some puts in UPS. That's really for you guys that are watching the daily market commentaries because I go over every trade that I do in the morning when I'm, where I take them off. That's usually when I set up my trades for the day uh, and or, you know, that, uh, for the next week or so, but I usually do those in the mornings before that market commentary. But if I see something in the afternoon or there's earnings, then I'm going to tweet those out for you guys because I want you guys to be able to play along and uh, see what I'm doing, see how everything shakes out. I just want to have full disclosure on what I'm doing so you guys know when and where I'm doing it, all right? So the long put diagonal. Long put diagonal is pretty easy. Basically, you are buying an in the money further expiration option, and then we're selling a near term, near expiration out of the money put, okay? That's basic uh, 101, what you're gonna get online, right? Well, I go into a little bit more detail here. I basically are gonna sell you, tell you <laughs> that this in the money put in the further expiration, what's further expiration? I go with 65 to 75 uh, days out in expiration on the one that I'm looking to buy, all right? And that is going to be about a 75 to 80 delta, all right? The one that's the out of the money, 
I'm going to be looking at 35 to 45 days to expiration. And I'm going to be looking at a 36-ish delta. Yes, I'm going to go into detail as to why I pick all of those in more detail here. Uh, but, you know, what you can kind of get from this is basically the out of the money option here is trying to finance all of the extrinsic value of this in the money option. So in the money options have intrinsic and extrinsic value. That in the money option, so if XYZ is trading 100 and we're talking about an in the money option, we're talking about like a 95 uh, strike, or sorry, a 105 put strike, right? That's in the money for the puts. So that in the money put has value real value because whatever that 105 strike is that's in the money is at least worth five dollars right because the stock is trading at 100 our strike is 105 that means that strike value that is in the money has a value of at least five dollars but the pricing is going to say maybe six dollars or you know like six dollars and fifty cents so that dollar fifty extra is what we want to finance. We need to pay off that dollar fifty by selling this out of the money in the nearer expiration, right? And usually the 36 delta will pay for around a 75-ish delta uh, in the money option, okay? No audio. Is anybody else not getting audio? Because you guys have uh, not really responded to my, can everybody else hear me? All right, now you're good. Okay, I noticed that you did leave and came back, Tapas, uh, when you didn't get sound. And that goes for just about anybody else. If you ever lose sound throughout it or you kind of log in on one of these and there's no sound, it's usually go to meetings issue. And if you log out and log back in, then you're pretty good, okay? So for future reference, those of you who can't hear me still, no, I can't help you right now. On, when you watch it again, though, you'll be able to see that, <laughs> right? Sorry. Um, uh, anyway, so our assumption is neutral to market bearish, okay? It's really bearish, but the why I say neutral is we just want a slow, a slow sell-off in this underlying. Not necessarily big whipsaw moves like we've seen in the markets as of recently because we don't really, for one, get the volatility to come out when we get that kind of move. Uh, two, this market neutral, we only really want that market neutral stance like in the first month. And if you watch the daily market commentaries, it's kind of setting up for this where I think we're going to settle down here uh, pretty soon, right around the point of control, which is kind of where we're ending up lately. Uh, that is going to hold the market there. So we'll be able to sell these options, let them decay, worthless, and then you want that move to happen, all right? Or just a slow move towards that um, short in or out of the money put, okay? We just don't want it to happen overnight because when it happens overnight, volatility has a tendency to expand and uh, that can really hurt, especially in the way that the markets have been acting recently, which is a little bit, outside the scope of what we'll see on a normal basis throughout the year. As a matter of fact, if you watched last week's webinar, I talked about uh, the environment in and around what we are seeing with these stocks where volatility farther out the curve or further duration had lower volatility than what we were seeing right here in the front months. And generally speaking, volatility affects the further duration options a little bit more. But because the market's kind of pricing this in for uh, the near term, we're seeing the spike in volatility in the front months and the back months aren't really catching up to that. So uh, it, that type of scenario is the perfect scenario for these diagonals but it's starting to normalize a little bit. And we'll go through that. I'll show you that more in detail when we pull up the, uh, the platform and talk about how that volatility has uh, been a little out of whack. But we just don't want that massive move right away. That's why I throw in that little neutral. I mean, it's not really neutral to say, but neutral to bearish kind of, you know, if you're neutral and you're bearish, it's kind of like right in between there. Like, 
think it's going to settle down, but it's going to continue at a slow uh, downward stepping uh, movement, if you will. We, you will get the recording of this, Tapas, yes. All right. So the essentials to success. These are the steps that I go through for every single strategy, right? Every single strategy has a different uh, uh, bullet point for my bullet points. For instance, with the environment, I'll have different uh, aspects to what the environment should be for a particular stock. What I talk about with the environment is implied volatility percent, okay? And what we need that implied volatility percent to be in order to set up this strategy is one of the most important things we need to know when we're setting up any strategy is what is implied volatility percent for this underline, because that determines what our strategy is. Okay. So when I'm going through these strategies in the webinar, I go picking the right environment. I come up with the implied volatility percent. After you learn all of these and you know the rules, what you're going to be doing is saying, X, Y, Z has this implied volatility percent. That means I need to go to this type of strategy, okay, for the higher probabilities of success, all right? For instance, buying options and high implied volatility percent is not appropriate. That is a low probability setup, okay? So what I talk about with this, the put diagonal is an IV percent of somewhere between 40 and 60. And that's middle of the road. It's mid range usually. Uh, it doesn't have to be set up in an IV percent of between 40 and 60. As a matter of fact, you will be able to do this strategy in just about any type of implied volatility uh, percent market for an under. Uh, underlying, okay? It can be up in the upwards of 100 and it'll still work out. It can be close to zero and it'll still work out according to some of my rules. But when we are at those extremes, there's all kinds of other strategies we can implement around that uh, type of environment that have higher probabilities of success, you know, than this would in those type of situations. So, picking the right environment. When we're setting this strategy up, we want IV percent to be somewhere mid-range, somewhere between 40 and 60. And when I pull up the platform here, this is what I'm talking about. Implied volatility percent off to the side here has uh, you know, somewhere between the 40s and 60s. So that's what we're gonna be looking at, right in the middle, not up the hundreds. We've got other strategies for that, not way down here at the lows, because again, there's better strategies for that situation and this same directional assumption, okay? Um, and then, uh, what was I going to say with the implied volatility percent? What this math is over here is as simple as you have a numerator and a denominator. And in the numerator, we take that sum and divide it by the sum in the denominator. In the numerator, we take where the current implied volatility is, which is 33.5. All right. I'm going to round everything. So let's just say 33. Current implied volatility, 33 minus the low, which is uh, 20. So in the numerator, we have 13. 13 divided by the sum of the high minus the low. The high is uh, 50 minus uh, 30 or minus 20 gives us 30. So 13 divided by 30 is somewhere in the, what is that? Close to 35, 36 percentile. So let's just look at the math. If I did 13 divided by 30, then we're going to get, yeah, 43%. My math is off. Uh, so that would fit in this rules. The 44%, 43% is mid-range. It's at the lower spectrum of it. But yes, it's still within that range. So CMG would be appropriate to so far to look at this strategy for because it's right there in the mid-range. It's got to follow all the other rules, though, too, right? You know, when I go through these, as a matter of fact, like you can go through it. And if, uh, if it fits my rule with this one environment, 40 to 60%, you can say it's a green light. If it's like 63, you know, 65%, start saying it's a yellow light. You know, same with 35% on the downside for a stock, right? If it's, you know, upwards of 100, I would say that's definitely a red light. So you get too many yellow lights, I would move on to a different 
strategy on these checklists. If you get any red lights, I would pretty much just walk away uh, from, from doing it. Look for other opportunities. All right. Picking the right underline. Now with this, what I talk about is the stock. Like we've all traded all kinds of crazy stock. AutoZone's one of them that um, I actually have on, on my uh, watch list over here probably. Uh, but it's a stock that everybody's pretty much heard about. Oh, that's not AutoZone. I forget what AutoZone's is right offhand. I'm having a blank. blank. Uh, A-Z-O-N. Anybody remember what AutoZone is? Anyway, uh, there are stocks in here that won't fit my rule, but my rule here is going to be, let's say on a stock under $100, we move the decimal place, or actually under $100, we want this option montage to be somewhere close to 10 cents from the bid to the ask. Now, Gilead Science, I can tell you, usually is inside that 10 cents, as you can see, some of them are very close. If it's 11, 12 cents on a stock under $100, I'd say that's one of your yellow lights, right? Uh, then if you, oh, AZ, oh, that's right. So if it's just outside of it, it's a yellow light. But when you have really high implied volatility, like the kind of volatile markets we've seen today, these markets are going to widen out from what they normally were. So even like Apple, who maybe usually has, three cent wide bid at to the bid ask, you know, 107 to 110 is probably, you know, maybe 105 to 108 now or something like that, where the markets are getting, a, or that's probably the same thing, 105 to 110. So it's maybe a nickel wide. So the markets are going to get a little wider because there's more risk. Think about it. The guys making the markets have to offset that risk. So the more volatile it is, you know, if he's buying a put, then he's probably looking to buy some stock with it, right? To hedge it as a trade. So in order to make his hedge cracked, he's got to get a couple of extra pennies on his options to go into the market because by the time he goes out there and buys that stock, it could very well have changed by, you know, a quarter or something. So the guy's got to be on top of it. Therefore, they're going to make markets a little bit wider when volatility really spikes. But for this rule, on picking the right underlying stock under $100. We want the options in the expiration cycle, closest to expiration to be somewhere uh, inside of 10 cents wide. The one that is being traded the most, it's usually that one that's inside of 45 days to 35 days is the spot month. You get inside of 15 days, people are uh, rolling out to this month and you're gonna see, uh, sorry, you're gonna see the volume start to increase. So 10 cents wide on a stock under $100. If it's over $100, uh, we want to just basically move the decimal place three ticks to the left. And that's how wide the bid offer should be. So in this case, it's 23 cents. We can go down here to the options, 43 days to expiration. We want to look at the ones that are just outside the money uh, for this rule. And you can see 10 cents wide. This one's uh, what, 15 cents wide. So that fits that rule, okay? Let's look at AZO um, for AutoZone and $800 stock we would expect, let's just say 90 cents wide from the bid to the ask and go in here and you can see that they are $4 wide or three, a little over $3 wide. That does not fit the rule. That's not even close to my rule to be quite honest. So this would be a red light. I would, I'm would. i not going to trade options in AutoZone and I probably wouldn't even do it for earnings. I don't wanna give up that much edge because with this type of edge, if I had to get into this trade, I might have to go all the way down to $30 to sell it on the call side. And think about that. I gave up $2.20 from the uh, where the offer was, $2.20 that theta decay of 36 cents a day. I'm going to have to be in this trade for a week and a half, two weeks just to get to break even, right? For this to decay at 36 cents a day, nothing else changes. Volatility doesn't change. The market doesn't move. Uh, the underlying just stays here. If I had sold those at $30, just theta alone coming out to get to back to break even, it's probably going to be, you know, five to uh, eight days 
of theta decay because each day 36 cents comes out of this and that's a long time to wait just to get to break even. Way too much risk. I'd walk away from it. So that's picking the right underlying. Under $100, 10 cents wide, over $100, move the decimal, three ticks to the left, one, two, three, 10 cents wide. Uh, it's after the close. FXE usually is a little tighter than this, but you can see over here, it's, it's inside of that rule. Okay, so use that uh, when determining option strategies in and around the underlying you're looking at. If it's wider than that, just know that you are starting to get into that gray area of maybe I shouldn't be trading this underlying or this strategy isn't appropriate for what we're looking at here. All right, the duration. We have two durations we have to worry about here. I mentioned it at the very beginning, right? We want to sell the long or we want to buy this long duration option somewhere right around here in the 75, uh, 75 to 80 ish days to expiration. That's the best case scenario. Uh, it gives you the best setup the way I've found it over the years. But you can see here the volatility or the theta coming out of those options is much slower than the ones inside of here. I'm saying sell it somewhere at the, when we set it up right in here, actually, it might, should be a little bit further that way. Um, but you can see once we get into this underlying somewhere in here, we want this theta to, ha to happen to that one we sold, right? This is the option we sold for, you know, price, we want that price to go down because we sold it. We sold it high. We want to buy it low. This one, we don't want to go down as fast, right? We want this one to stay flat if we could. Uh, but we, if at the end of the day, we get this one decaying faster than this one out here, it means that we paid off that extrinsic value I talked about, right? Because out of the money options are all extrinsic value. There's no there's no real value to an out of the money option other than like theta decay volatility and those things. But there's no quantitative value for it other than those components that will decay out. The ones that are in the money have value because they they are in the money. That has to be what it's worth. Uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, if the stock's trading 100, we're using the 105 puts. Those 105 puts are at least worth $5 at the end of the day. If everything were to go out, you know, today, uh, that stock settles at a, or goes out $100 on the last day of the option, that option is worth $105. There's going to be some extrinsic value in there, but with that extrinsic value, we're going to try and pay it off so we don't have to worry about it. Thus, we're isolating theta decay and volatility, right? That's the whole point of this strategy is to isolate those two components. We want to isolate the volatility because we don't want to have to worry about it right now. Volatility is all over the board. If we don't have to think about volatility affecting our options premium, then we're just looking at our directional assumption. Does that make sense for everybody? That's why we want to neutralize volatility. And that's this, that's why it's best to do this also around that IV percent of around somewhere between 40 and 60 because We've isolated it. It's one of those situations when we're at that level of implied volatility percent, we don't really know if it's going to go up or down. We're not at an extreme. When I teach anything just about, I want the extremes because the extremes are where people come in and the market starts turning around the other way. So, um, and that goes with implied volatility. It's at 100%. It wants to come back down to the median, this middle of the road area I'm talking about. When it's at zero, there's no volatility. It wants to start coming back up. It's just like any other chart. You saw in that uh, before, the chart, this chart down here, if I told you that was pricing on a stock, you'd be like, okay, well, look, volatility does the same thing. It goes to its extremes and then comes back. You know, I talk about charting and stuff like that in the daily market commentaries where you get at these extremes, it wants to come back to the point of control. So it's a similar situation. The point of control basically for implied volatility is right there in the middle. Right. And picking the right strikes. Again, I mentioned this briefly. We're going to be buying that further duration 
in the money put at around a 75 to 80 delta. And then we're gonna sell that near duration option uh, at around a 36 delta, okay? But almost more importantly than all of that, we want to pay no more than 75% the width of the strikes. So we want to pay less than 75% the width of the strikes, okay? Less than 75%. So on a $10 wide spread, you know, if my example, the XYZ is trading at 100, we're buying the 95 or we're buying the 105 put in the uh, February, and then we're going to be selling, say, the 95 put in the January. Okay, so that's $10 wide. If it's $10 wide, we don't want to pay more than 75% the width, which is $7.50, right? Pretty simple, right? Some of them we're going to have to do, uh, the cal we're going to have to pull up the old trusty calculator and come up with something. But for right now, uh, what we want is to come up with something that is less than 75% the width of the strikes. Now, when I was doing the call put diagonal, sometimes it's a little bit more difficult to get it uh, with the call diagonal than it is with the put diagonal. Uh, just the way that people are bought buy puts and stuff like that um, in spike volatility a little bit is it makes it a little bit easier for us with the puts. All right, so don't pay more than 75 percent the width of the strikes. We may want to make sure we cover our extrinsic value of that long put. All right. And we actually would even prefer a credit because if we get a credit of that extrinsic value, then that means we're paying into what that uh, value of that option is, right? When I was talking about that 105 put that's in the money and we're trying to pay off that extra dollar of extrinsic value. Well, if I paid off a dollar 50 of that extrinsic value, then in a sense, I sold this underlying short higher than where I could have possibly done it in the open markets. And I'll show you some examples of that exactly when we get through all of these fun slides, but I wanna make sure you guys are clear of concept and have these this as a checklist to go through. Now, knowing your exit strategy before entering the trade, this is something important. And I usually talk about it from the exit of a profitable strategy um, because a lot of times when we're trading and we get to that profit target, if you don't write it down, you have a tendency to kind of let that thing meld a little bit more. Uh, don't do that, especially in the beginning. Get out at the... Uh, the target. And for this one, I've mentioned a couple of times, let's just stick with that $10 wide spread that we paid $2.50 for, right? Then our max profit on this trade, if it's $10 wide, we paid $7.50, it's $2.50. That's our max profit. That's at the end of the day, the underlying is trading, you know, to the penny at our short strike. The likelihood of that happening is zero and none, and I think zero just left down. Um, so what we wanna do is take a percentage of that. And that's one of the things I champion about all my strategies is get out early while the getting's good. And with this one, $7 or $2.50 is our max profit. We're gonna look to take about 50% of that. So $1.25 is where I'm looking to get out. Now, if our short strike, our short put is tested, let's say, you know, five to uh, more days in duration away from where we set this up, you know, pretty much all other things being equal, that uh, will be a point where we can cover that trade for a 50% um, of max profit, all right? So th that's what we're looking for, is have our short strike get tested, kissed, there's a high probability of that happening within the time that we're setting this up for. It's a low probability if you're going for the full boat, $2.50, okay? So increase your probabilities of success, get out early, and then just move on to another situ or another strategy, a new uh, scenario, okay? So know your exit strategy, getting out, 
50% of max profit is the key here. Now, a lot of people ask me, what do you, what do, you do on the downside? If I paid $7.50, how am I going to play that out? I have a higher risk tolerance than most people. I let it play out. Uh, you can do all kinds of things with this. Um, and, and if you're a chartist and you look at something like FXE and um, you want to do some Fibonacci's and stuff like that, I can't see the extension, but let's just say there was a, a level right here where we had a, um, a line, you know, a support level. Sorry. Um, let me go to a different one. Charts, let me just give it a new chart. So this is a better one. So target, let's just say we were bearish on target, all right? And you thought it was gonna break to here uh, and trade down to the 63, okay? And that's basically what our game plan was then get out when it hits there, right? If you think that's support and it's not going to break it, and even if your strike is down here, when it comes down and kisses that level, get out, write it down. I'm getting out when it goes down to the 50 uh, Fibonacci, all right? On the flip side, if you were doing this strategy, playing it for this, and it came up and tested this one or broke through this uh, Fibonacci, the 23 Fibonacci, then that's where you get out. All right. I usually play it out because it's a, I play out my debit strategies and let them basically expire worthless unless my market assumption changes. Being I went from bearish to bullish in target. All right. That's when I would cover mine on the losing end. Um, you, if I'm still bearish in target, then I would let it uh, play out. But I am going to get out at 50 percent of my max profit on this. Right. So I'm playing out the probabilities on the worst end because the probabilities are in my favor in that regard. But my probabilities of having that full width of the spread in my favor at the expiration is not as likely. And that's why I'm willing to get out early. Right. If I have low probabilities of success and I'm successful, why wouldn't I get out? I don't care what it is. And if I have a high probability of success, but it's against me right now, why not stay in it? The probabilities are still in my favor. Okay. That's the way I look at it. All right. And then let's go over the max profit. I've, I've mentioned it a couple of times, but I want to make sure everybody's clear of concept on the uh, max profit and max loss. Max profit is the width of the strikes minus the debit paid, right? Our example has been time and time again, $10 wide, we pay $7.50. What's our max profit? 2.5, $2.50, right? Now it can be considered unlimited or at least a zero if we buy the, you know, we let those long duration puts, uh, we hold on to that whole strategy. Maybe the strategy wasn't going in our favor, and those short puts expired worthless that, you know, we created that spread with. We just said, you know what, we're riding out the long puts uh, to see what happens, play out the probabilities. Then you have a much higher uh, profit potential, obviously, right? Because then it's not defined anymore. There's no width of the spreads. And then our max loss is that debit pay. In our example, $10 wide, we paid $7.50. That's as wide as it or that's as much as we can lose. Anytime we pay a debit. I see uh, your question there. I'm going to answer it here in a second. And then finally, the break even is the long put strike minus the debit paid. So the long put, like I mentioned earlier, we are talking about a 105 strike in the puts. And we paid... Uh, 105 in the puts, let's just say we paid $5 for it, then our break even would be when the underlying is trading at uh, $100. All right, sorry, lost my train of thought. I had a, a teenager uh, trying to get my attention. All right, so that's the break even, long put minus the debit paid. All right, All right, and the volatility can affect the break even. You know, this is at, all of these things are at expiration, what those, um, break evens are and things of that nature. We're looking to get out way earlier and volatility can affect those uh, as we go along. All right, 
We want it to go down so weak and and or overbought stock. Yes, absolutely. As a matter of fact, let's pull up the platform here. Uh, nobody else has any other questions about those rules there. Let's look at a couple of things. Now, we've seen, let's say, Facebook and just about any tech stock really get beat up in this overall uh, move recently, right? It's more or less a sector rotation. Anytime you see this kind of move, something else is going up, right? It could be gold. People could be parking their money there or in bonds, which we've seen. But there's always something going up, even though something else is going down, right? And we could look at something like even uh, Kellogg or something like that, where now well, Kellogg's not a great example of it. Obviously, I was just going to throw out any staple, but we could look at Clorox. Um, but these are the type of things that I was talking about. The, this doesn't look anything like the broader market, but you could see also Clorox was going down when the market was going up. Is it inversely related to the overall market? No. Uh, a lot of people were buying top, uh, tech stocks in this area and they were dumping all their other ones, right? So when Banu was talking about extreme overbought, I would say this is overbought for the type of scenario or the type of... Uh, markets we've seen recently, right? And if the market really does start getting up or trajectory, that's going to be because tech is starting to come back in. And once we start seeing that come back in, we are likely to see some of these other ones uh, start to lose a little bit of favor going forward, okay? So those are some of the ones that I like to look at for this scenario, a little bit overbought, Clorox, is probably not going to fit my rule of thumb um, for the bid ask. It should be 16 cents wide. So we're not getting that. I'd move on. All of the other things look pretty good, but I don't want to give up 50 cents edge to get into this strategy. Because think about it, I'm doing two, two legs. And when you go further out in time also, it's going to get wider, right? Because there's more risk for that guy on the uh, further duration. So he's going to make it a little bit wider, all right? Um, so I'm going to have to give up, you know, 20, 25 cents edge here, 20, 25 cents edge on the other side of giving up 50 cents edge. That's all. That's too much for me to deal with. I'd rather give up pennies. OK, so something overbought, oversold. So this is the time of the webinar where you guys can start throwing out your stocks that you're bearish on um, or you have a bearish assumption on. And I'll go through all of these rules step by step to see if it fits uh, according to my rules. All right. Somebody threw out Procter and Gamble right off the bat. Must be a another staple. Somebody's following my lead. Yeah. So here's another one. Right. We've gotten this upward trajectory move. Is it overdone to the upside? Somebody could say this is tweezer tops. You know, if you guys are, uh, you guys are probably looking at this. Fibonacci and like, hey, Wolfman, dude, your Fibonacci lines are off. Well, I don't change them very often, you guys. Um, I leave them there because as this has acted as resistance before, it's getting a little overdone to the uh, upside. I may need to change this one. This is obviously old. Now that I have tweezer tops, that might be the catalyst for me to change my Fibonacci's, right? But I have a tendency to like my Fibonacci's, especially when they come very close to lining up with my uh, market profile over here on the side. So Procter & Gamble, I would say is a good scenario, me being the contrarian to set this up. So we have a $93 stock, it's under $100, they should at least be 10 cents wide. You can see that it fits that rule. Now, this strategy is quoted from the further duration, okay? Because it's quoted from what the va the value of it is. So since we're buying this further out, uh, it's we're gonna be paying more for it, all right? So it's gonna be a debit spread. So it's gonna be the Feb Jan. Now I have a bad habit of quoting everything from the front month to the back month. And that's because of my 25 years and 30 day Fed funds, everything was quoted from the front to the back, even the options were quoted backwards to facilitate that whole flow of you quote from the front to the back. So I am 
bad about getting out of that habit. You can imagine 20 years of saying it the same way every single day, 500 times a day. It is very difficult for me to stop that bad habit, even though it's been a few years. All right. So there are several years, I should say, at this point. So let's look at it. I was talking about somewhere between that 70 and 80 delta option. So we're going to go in here and look at the 100 strike. So I'm going to buy the 100 uh, Feb option in the money, right? This is the 100 put in the Feb. That's in the money. Now you can see right here, this is the 100 strike. So this 100 strike has intrinsic and extrinsic value. And we can easily say the 100 strike has $6.45 of intrinsic value. That's what it's worth, right? From here to where the underlying is trading, the difference is $6.45. That's what it's worth right now. But you can see you have to pay basically about a dollar or $1.50 more than that. One of the uh, floor trader hacks is look over here at the um, option that corresponds to it, correlates to it. It is very close to the extrinsic value that we need to pay. So I'm going to look at it somewhere. It's now that I know it's a dollar, I'm just going to go down here and say, this is the one I need to sell for about a dollar, right? We know the extrinsic value that I'm trying. This option I'm selling is paying off the extrinsic value of this option. All right. So we can double check that. Where's our break even? $6 minus that $100, right? Our break even becomes $93.61. So $93.61. You can see I can sell this underlying uh, a little bit higher than when the last trade was. It's still within the bid offer, but you can see that I'm able to sell it a little bit higher than where it last traded. So that's good. That means, um, that means that I've gotten basically rid of all the extrinsic value. Uh, then we can look at, it's $10 wide and we're paying $6.39. Does anybody know what we're paying in percentage value, the width of the spread? Without me having to do the math, 64%, right? Six dollars and so six dollars and thirty nine cents divided by ten dollars is going to give us sixty three ninety. So that fits the rule. This is one of those things I was talking about uh, that we are going to be able to see it a little bit easier to fit these rules for um, for this strategy than maybe the calls. And somebody says RTN and waiting. Oh. Uh, it's waiting for a name. I get it. All right. So that one would fit this rule. $10 wide, $6.39. You know, you can go up here and look at this. Uh, $10 wide. I did the $100 strike. You know, if yours is like, and for this one, I might very well change my rule where I'm just going to stick this thing out because I've got these tweezer tops here. For this strategy, if I put it on today, I might write down on my booklet over here that I am getting out of this strategy as soon as we make a new high, all right? Because it's broken my chart setup that I was looking at. I think it's tweezer tops. It's going to roll over. We're at extreme levels. All of those things um, make me believe it's going to go down. Well, we break these tweezer tops. It's broken the chat, uh, the pattern. I'm out. And I have no problem with you guys doing that. One thing I mentioned also at other web webinars, I write down every single trade I do, you guys. I write down the environment. Uh, I write down why I got into it, what led me to this assumption. And then I also write down, which is probably one of the most important things, where I'm getting out of this strategy. And why is that important? Because again, I've seen too many people say, I'm going to do this trade. I'm going to get out here. And then it gets there and they don't get out because it's an arbitrary number. You haven't like made it, you know, just like they say, if you write down a goal, you're more likely to achieve that goal. Well, make sure you write these down because it's the same idea is if you don't have a write down, written down, you're not holding yourself accountable. If you write it down, 
There's accountability there. It's staring you in the eye, all right? So make sure you write everything down. I mean, I've got four notepads here from all the trades I put in. I, I write them down, keep them right here, and uh, keep track of it. All right, so that one works. All right, so waiting for name <laughs> is uh, RTN. Let's look at RTN. So RTN, I haven't traded, so I don't know anything about this stock. It's $100. $60, $170 stock should be 17 cents wide. It's a little bit wider than what I'm usually uh, willing to deal with. Um, and we can look at volume and open interest and that's why. You can see there's just not a whole lot of open interest, meaning there's not a whole lot of participation going on in here. It looks like they've gotten some moves today, but you know, for me, it would be something I would stay away from. It's just a little too wide. If you like trading this and you're used to trading this underline, then you know all all things being equal, just say that this is one of those yellow lights, all right? You know, you get too many yellow lights, walk away from it. But for me, I'm I'm not gonna probably trade that one. Sorry, I'll look at your other one, McDonald's, because I'm pretty sure this one's gonna fit the rule. We can move this three ticks to the left. We can say 18, 19 cents wide. And it's not going to fit the rule because it's after the markets. But generally speaking, McDonald's will fit that rule uh, right now. Very close, but just outside. Um, this might be one of those yellow lights. We all trade McDonald's um, a lot. So let's say that it works. Uh, therefore, let's look at the in the money options further in duration. We're going to need to go back to our Delta. You can see that another product of that is you know the further in the money you go with these the wider they're going to be so that's why you also want to start out with really tight markets because when volatility steeps in they get a little bit wider and the further out you go they get a little bit wider so if you're ever wanting to roll these out in time and stuff like that that will come into um you know affect you will start affecting you uh yes this is being recorded and i even if you uh, watch this thing all the way through. I suggest watching it one more time because as you can see, we're uh, going through some of this stuff maybe really a little bit faster than most people are accustomed to. And therefore, when you watch it again, it will make it sink in. But let's stick with McDonald's in this example. So we're looking somewhere that, you know, 75 to 80 Delta. So that's the 195s. Look over here. We need at least $3 to pay that off. Uh, that should... This is gonna be as close as I can really wanna go. So let's sell that one. Um, look at our break even, subtract the $9 from the 95. That gives us 104.85, right? If my math is correct in my head, or sorry, I gotta subtract one, uh, sorry, that's 184.95. So 184.95, we're selling this a little bit below where we are, because remember, we couldn't pay off all of that $3 over here when we did it. Let's look at the other side. So that's a yellow light. We're already in the hole because, uh, you know, we're selling this underlying in a sense, or this, we're doing this strike below where the underlying is trading. Is that everybody clear that? I said that improperly the first time. We're buying this in the money option and we want to buy it where, you know, where our break even is above where the underlying is trading, right? We want it to go down, but we still would rather be have our break even above where we are. Uh, and this one, our break even is going to be just below where we're currently trading. So we have a little bit of room to make up. But we have $15 wide spread, right? And we're paying $9.15. So $9.15 divided by the $15 spread gives us 61. So that's pretty good. Uh, anytime you're in the 60s and you're only paying 60% the width of the strikes, that's pretty darn good. So that might make up for the wider bid ask that I was talking about. You know, that's the yellow light. Now this is a really, really green light. So that in a sense offsets some of that problem we saw in the other one because we're only paying 60% the width of the spread. That's a great situation to have. One thing I forgot to mention about 
this particular underlying or this uh, strategy as well with the environment. When we are talking about volatility, we're talking about that mid range volatility. One thing you have to have with this strategy to make it a green light is you want these two volatility coefficients to be very close in proximity. All right. Now I say two to three percentage points. This is within that rule. That's two to three percentage points higher is a green light. Anything outside of that, say three to five percentage points difference. This went from 2150 to say 2650. Then that is a yellow light. Anything more than that, I say is a red light. Walk away. It's too much difference because if it's, you know, eight percentage points difference, that means we're paying for volatility here and we're selling low volatility here. We're buying high volatility and selling low volatility if this is that much higher. Now, if you watch last week's recording or last week's uh, strategy, strategy, we were talking about this. It was a, an odd situation where we could throw a dart at the dart or at the watch list and pick just about anything because volatility here in these closer duration expiration uh, montage was higher than back here. Anytime this volatility is higher than here and you don't have an earnings, then that is a full blown, you know, go. Okay. You don't have to even worry about it. But in normal market situations, volatility will generally be higher further out. So make sure the difference is less than two to three percentage points difference. Okay. If it's three to five or three to six, that's a yellow light. Anything over that, walk away from. Anytime this is higher than this and there's no earnings here, then you don't have to uh, even think, okay? Now, um, another thing, we don't want earnings in this front month we're selling. We never really want that uh, because volatility uh, will have a tendency to start increasing here. And when that volatility comes out, uh, we, we're stuck with that spread. We don't care if the the earnings is in this one we buy because we're expecting volatility to expand heading into an earnings, right? So that works for us. We're buying volatility out here uh, to expand. We just don't want that volatility to go down, especially if we paid a lot for that volatility out here, um, you know, like three, to five percentage points higher out here. We do not want volatility to go down because it will hurt us rather quickly, all right? So that is a good uh, example of something that we need to talk about for that. We need to make sure those are a little bit tighter. All right, Intel was another one. Oop, Intel. Let's look at Intel here. So Intel, we can see right here is mid-range, 50 ID percent. They don't have earnings in the cycle I'm selling, which is this January one. It comes just after that. So we're good with that. We just want to have that opportunity to see volatility uh, come out or not even have to worry about the earnings. We want it to be able to expire worthless and not have to deal with it. All right. So that works. Now we're going to go out here and start looking for that 80-ish delta Probably I usually lean towards coming tighter to the market, but I don't I don't love selling half strikes, to be quite honest. Um, so I'm gonna go a little bit further out on this one and buy the 80 delta. So what do we do? We look right over here. I've got about 60 cents in extrinsic value I need to pay off. So it's kind of a pick 'em here. I'm gonna go a little bit tighter here for this one, just to give you a good example of it. Um, 55 minus $6 and 61 cents gives us, uh, is at 47, 41, seven, uh, right. Yeah. So wait, did I do that right? 47. Yeah. 48, 48, no, 47, 41. So 47, 41 is our break even. It's a little bit lower than here. Am I doing that right? 55 minus six dollars would give us 49 it's 48 or sorry yeah 48 40 48 39 it's right there where we're trading i knew i was doing my math wrong uh so it's right where we're trading 
That works. $10 wide, we're paying $6.63. That's 66% the width of the stripes, right? We can do that math easy, right? We know that that's $10 wide. We can easily do the, the width there. That works. It fit the rule of thumb with 10, uh, being 10 cents wide to the bid ask. That works. It does our uh, option montage say we're basically two to three percentage points. If we say this is two and a half, so three, it starts to be a little bit of a yellow light there, right? We're getting, we're paying for some volatility here. I think that uh, we can look at the charts, think it's gonna come down and test this point of control. All of those things, everything else that I talked about, all my other assumptions work for it. That one thing um, where it's a little bit wider, mostly due to that volatility uh, because that volatility has the earnings, um, you know, we might be able to deal with that thinking, okay, volatility should expand going into that earnings uh, and we'll benefit from that. All right. So you can do that. You can think through that scenario that way. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. All right. Does anybody else have any other examples? I wanted to show one thing of, um, while I'm waiting, NVIDIA, I think everybody's pretty clear of it. NVIDIA has that situation where um, it's a little wider, right? They have the earnings in there, five, you know, four percentage points difference. That would make that uh, like a yellow light. You know, all of the other rules are going to kind of follow in on NVIDIA, generally speaking, with a 15 cent wide and stuff like that, this would have had been one of those where it was a little bit wider. All right, finally, I'll go with the last one. I just saw a pop up, Goldman Sachs. Sorry if I didn't get to you guys. Uh, some of yours, I'm not gonna be able to get to. So the implied volatility percent is a little high here, 96. So, you know, in that, if I was bearish in this, I'd probably just sell uh, calls against it. But I'll show you uh, in this that we probably would be able to do it. Oh, it doesn't have the February, so I'd stay away from it. You start getting out here, we're not going to be able to, you want to make it like the next option cycle, if at all possible as well, because you go too far out, um, we're not going to be able to get that extrinsic value paid off very easily, right? We're going to be doing this 80 delta and selling the one that's right there, uh, on the 180. So we don't have a whole lot of room for error. Okay. So I'm going to stay away from that one. Volatility is too high. And, um, but it is a good example of, you know, when implied volatility is higher in the front, we'd be buying lower volatility than we're selling here. But that leads me to believe that they have earnings. Yeah. So they do have that earnings in the one I'm selling. That's why I don't want to deal with it. And one of the keys to that, even if you don't know where the earnings are, if you see where the volatility spikes outside of the rest of them, that's usually right where the volatility is laying. Okay. But this is the example we were giving last Friday of when volatility is higher than there and there's no earnings, that is a full on green light. That whole percentage point difference doesn't matter. Percentage point difference is going from like higher out the curve. So from 31 to 34, not 34, and it goes down, that's good because we're paying less for volatility here than we're able to sell up here. But it's way too far out for this di diagonal to work for that because they don't have the, the months. All right. And that's about it, guys. So if you guys have learned anything at all from me today, why my thing isn't wanting to show up, I, I don't know. <laughs> But this is the, the deal right here, you guys. This is a special trading webinar offer. Uh, I have all of these videos in here. There's more than 10 videos. Basically, rising interest rates, which is something we've had to deal with. You guys should be actively uh, managing your portfolio of bonds or bond ETFs because those things are going to be getting hurt in a rising interest rate environment. And I talk about how to counteract some of that and you have to stay on it and stay diligent and and mechanical throughout that but income in 
generation, the history of options, which is a really fun one. So take advantage of this, you guys. It is protecting your portfolio and trying to, you know, increase your alpha for $36. You can't beat it. All right. You know, one bad trade because you didn't follow my rules is worth that $36, you guys. You know, I'm trying to streamline your process of the 25 years of me banging my head up against the wall, doing the wrong things to figure out what I'm doing, what needed to be done right, okay? So take advantage of this. The best way to become a better trader is constantly learn. You guys have obviously taken that first step here, but it isn't going to be enough just trading, you know, Fibonacci's and things of that nature, just using technical analysis. But what I'm trying to do is make you become a more consistent trader. And when you become a more consistent trader, then you're going to be able to put on more opportunities and that's gonna ultimately build confidence going forward, you guys. So that is one of the most important things I can teach you guys is, you know, even just for, if you are still thinking about, am I making money or losing money on this trade? You're, you're approaching it completely wrong. You have to look at it Am I uh, making the probabilities work in my favor? Okay, that's what you have to do. You have to forget about the money. You have to forget about how much money I'm up and down on a day or on a trade. You have to think about it. The probabilities are the probabilities and I'm gonna play them out and I'm gonna stay mechanical to increase those probabilities even further in my favor. It's the only way to truly create alpha, you guys. All right, so using the right tools in the right situation, you guys are gonna be more productive state of mind, put on more strategies, create more opportunities, and ultimately become a very confident trader. All right, so take advantage of that for 36 bucks. I can't emphasize it enough. Oh, somebody's asking me, yes, I forgot to put the link in the chat window. Let me do that right now. Link is in the chat window over there. So you can easily click on it. If you guys are watching it again on tape delay, just pause it, punch this into your URL and you will be able to get the deal. But the easiest way is to go ahead and click on that link in the chat window. And finally, I just want to thank you guys all for attending this web webinar and later webinars. I'm going to be drilling down on different option components, how I trade those options, when and where I find them appropriate. Also, Daily market commentaries, I usually am throwing on one of these strategies the day after that. So make sure you keep your eye out for that in the daily market commentaries. Here's also the link. Again, it's not a hot link. You're going to have to pause and punch this into your URL. Just want to thank you guys all for watching. You can contact us at 310-598-6677 or trading at protraderstrategies.com. Thank you, guys. I see a bunch of you guys are blowing me up with kind words. I appreciate that. Uh, yes, this is going to be basically good for a couple of days for you guys that watch this. Uh, you get it in the email to watch it again. Uh, you can still take advantage of that. But I would suggest just clicking on that easy link right there and jump on it right now. All right. That's it. You guys, if you can't take that, take it easy. Take care, everybody.